Good afternoon. My name is Kim Dorman, and I serve as the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. It's my pleasure to introduce today's program, Art at the Intersection of Immigration, Gender, and Disability. I want to start by thanking you all for joining us, both in person in our community room and virtually on Zoom. We would also like to thank the Lewis Center for the, of the Arts for their generous co-sponsorship of this program. Before we get to the heart of the program, I'd like to bring us together in this space with some housekeeping notes. The event will run for about an hour, and there will be an opportunity for audience members, both in person and virtually, to ask questions. We have someone on the live stream monitoring the Q&A function for questions for the presenter, and for those in person, simply raise your hand to uh, get a microphone. With thanks to the Lewis Center for the Arts, we are able to invite ASL interpreters to this program. This room is T-Coil enabled, so if you have a T-Coil enabled device, Please feel welcome to switch it on at this time. If you don't have a device and would like to use one of our headsets, we have some available on the piano. Uh, to make sure that the system works and that our questions can be heard by both audience members and the interpreters, it's important to speak into the microphone. The library does not yet have a land acknowledgement, um, but I would like to personally note that the library stands in the Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenape people. We wish to lift up the work of the state-recognized tribal communities in New Jersey, the Ramapo Lenape Indian Nation, the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation, and the Powhatan Lenape Nation. I also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs this nation was created. I'd like to offer a personal thank you to our presenters for all the loving labor, to use Christopher's words, um, that they've both put into making sure that this program was not only thought-provoking, but also thoughtfully advertised, that the room was not just ADA compliant, but welcoming and comfortable. It is through their hard work and generosity, and the generosity of the Lewis Center, that we are able to provide to work with ASL interpreters for the first time ever at the library. <laughs> Uh, also, a lot of my own personal goals for the library have been pushed forward considerably because of this loving, the loving labor of the people here today, and the library will be a better place for it. Thank you. <laughs> Our speakers this afternoon are Christopher Unpesver, um, I just said it right, you say <laughs> Unpesverde Nunez and Maria Elise Burgos Melendez. Uh, Christopher, uh, born in Costa Rica, is a visually impaired choreographer, dramaturg, educator, and disability advocate based in New York City. Nunez is a Princeton University Arts Fellow, 2022 to 24, a Leslie Lohman Museum of Art Fellow, and is a two-time recipient of the Emergency Grant by Foundation for Contemporary Arts. His performances have presented, been presented by the Joyce Theater, the Brooklyn Museum, the Kitchen, Dan Space Project, Movement Research at the Judson Church, the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, CUE Art Foundation, among others. Maria Elise Lely Burgos Melendez, um, has a Master's of Dance Studies, Afro-Taina Arawak Independent Artistic Researcher, Somatic Movement Educator, Embodied Writer, Dance Audio Describer, and Communicator from um, Barrique. Uh, since 2014, she investigates the narratives, experiences, and poetics of artistic mobility, migration of dancers and performers from Puerto Rico, the Greater Caribbean, and Latin America. Please join me in welcoming uh, Christopher Nardis. <laughs> and some interesting things that we're going to talk about. Um, Christopher and I um, had conversations prior, many conversations as colleagues and friends and co-workers. Um, we want to acknowledge that we speak from our own experiences as artists and migrants, and we are not necessarily speaking for the greater um, community and the different experiences of different people migrating. Um, or moving to geographical locations or being displaced. So by no means we're going to speak on behalf of everyone. We're talking from a very personal um, experience. So that's something that we um, want to make clear that we stay also um, part of our methodology and part of the process of engaging in generating co-stories and co-histories is part of the colonial lens. Like history is made in collectivity. There's no one big history, or one big history with big age or capital age. 
Um, so part of the, um, the colonial methodology is also gathering different uh, stories and uh, experiences. That is what makes history. So for me, this process of like talking about processes, maybe commonalities, maybe differences, is also part of the endeavor of like crafting and weaving histories together. Mm. Um, I have plenty of questions <laughs> in my love process. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that I am a native person from Borique. Borique is the name, the original native na name of Puerto Rico, who is going through a very uh, specific crisis right now. So I want to acknowledge that um, I am a displaced person, and I live in the Lapenhoking, uh, specifically in the Canarsi um, tribe area. And I benefit, I suffer from and benefit from colonization from the process of colonization. That's something that um, we need to um, deal with. And we're going to talk about that. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. And I think that is a good side way to ask you, Christopher, <laughs> um, if you could speak a little bit like, where do you come from? What is home to you, spiritually, spiritually or geographically, if you can define or what is being home for you right now? Mm. Thank you, Maria Liz. And thank you everybody for being here. Also, Princeton for hosting the library, for hosting this wonderful event, ASL Interpreters. And I just want to take a, a brief moment to describe myself for the visually impaired community that might be online mm -hmm. um, experiencing this. I am a Latino man, cisgender man. I have beer, but you cannot see it because I'm wearing a mask. And I'm dressed in black, which is not a surprise. Okay. It never changes. It's black every day now. Um, and I am six feet tall, and I'm wearing a hat. And this is a beautiful space. Um, the beautiful lighting, and we have a wonderful, beautiful wall in the background, a wooden wall. And let's see, yeah, so description done, checked, <laughs> access checked. Question now. Uh, home, home is a state of mind for me. It is a state of mind. I was born in Costa Rica, but um, I come from a long history of nomads, um, this tradition of moving across the space which is a little bit of a different relationship that indigenous communities had in that time. I'm talking about the 1800s from South America, Central America, a very different relationships to the relationship the uh, native communities might have with the land in the US because it's a different mm -hmm. history. Yes. Um, so we have a different understanding of land, water, water also as the land, you know, fisher, fisherman communities based near the oceans. Um, and this is because we have a sense of transitional homes. You know, home is a state of mind. And so we build homes everywhere that we go, um, but we never settle. We, you know, as a community of indigenous people, I'm talking specifically now the Miskito, Miskito communities, which is my heritage. Um, we just moved across geographies and um, I don't know, maybe looking for that ideal home. So home is a dream, home is a fantasy, home is a concept, home is um, a work in progress. <laughs> that is home, always. So it's a complicated relationship to, you know, more based or the specific geographies. Obviously, you know, now home is where my family is, my husband, where I can find love and warmth and feel welcome and be myself. Home can also be the stage as a dancer, as mm -hmm. a choreographer. Mm -hmm. Home can be a book, a book that is speaking to me about my own experience or someone else's experience. Home is this process of research. What is happening? And in the US particularly, um, it was very difficult to find home uh, because it required a process of re-educating myself. Mm -hmm. So I needed to deconstruct myself and then take the time to build something 
based on everything that was surrounding me. And I started to read books. I started to, which is the best way to understand somebody else's culture. I just started having conversations with people, the community, the dance community, black, uh, disabled, trans, indigenous, communities of color, conversations with white people, um, and understanding the very painful, complicated, beautifully diverse history of the U.S. And I am building a home based on this research as well. Thanks for mentioning that, building a home. Um, I, I oftentimes think in home as a verb. Um, I've been studying mobility and migration, my own mobility and migration, the history of my family, but also listening and hearing and talking to Puerto Rican artists who have migrated, establish themselves, whether like abroad, like in the US side of the world, or you know, their places in, um, in the non called United States. Um, and I think throughout my process of researching about history and about home, um, I stumbled upon this anthropological research a while back um, that really proposed home as a verb. So then I started using the word homing mm. and playing with the word homing. And what did that, what does that, what did that mean to me or what does that mean to me when you're like really either by force, by necessity, or purposely moving from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so home in that term, if it's what you said, it's like it's in the making, mm -hmm. it's in the building, it's mm -hmm. in like, it could be in relationship to a specific geographical space, but if you come from a, from a nomad heritage, it could be something else that may not necessarily be in relationship to a specific land, but to the vastness of mm -hmm. the lands and the space and actually in transition. Correct. So thanks for that, for saying that. Um, you mentioned, um, and I have a, a few questions, and I want to um, be mindful of like how to transit them. You talk about relearning, you talk about education, and I think I'm going to try to weave in these two ideas or these two um, notes about how, do you, how are you making home right now in that research that is happening that is helping you make home um, through your artistry. Mm. So, what are you investigating through your art? What concepts, ideas, what experiences in your body are you investigating? And how are they helping you in in building home if they are? Or if not, it could be totally like not leaning into that way. So maybe talking more about how that process of research and education is for you. Uh, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a great question. It's, and you know the reason that that's a great question? Because if, if there is a model that is broken by colonization and capitalism, is the arts. The arts is continuously living in this state of exploitation, suffering, um, underappreciation, um, you know, just what some people call the hustle just because they want to make it sound more poetic or maybe, I don't know, but it's really true the art practice that I'm trying to implement now in my life that I realize I'm building a home and is because something that really struck me when I first moved to New York City is artists live in this kind of ocean of ignorance in a way. They don't know where they come from, they don't know who was here before them, they don't know how the system works, they don't know what money is, they don't know capitalism. It's like they live in this constant denial, you know, I don't sell my art, I don't do it for money, but to me the best way to decolonize the work in the arts is understanding money, understanding the economic system, understanding capitalism, how can I compensate my dancers, how can I pay the stage manager, you know, how can we build an ecosystem in which we don't live in this anxiety, constant state of anxiety or rage, because people are upset and frustrated, and so those were the first thing that I was, you know, sensing in the air when I first arrived in New York City almost 10 years ago. People were upset, people were hurt, people were frustrated, and I didn't want to replicate any of these practices. Um, I realized that I needed to take more time. And people say to me, you know, the last performance that I did commission was three years ago. Um, I know other choreographers who have done 20 commissions in those three years. Um, yeah, but I'm not broken. 
I'm not broken. And I'm not broke, either. <laughs> I mean, you can make 20 commissions, yeah, but that doesn't mean that the system is really supporting your work. You know, I don't know. You know, if you go from one commission to another, from one show to another, but you're only getting $5,000 for each commission, I mean, you're just replicating a system that is, push is pushing you to understand what you want. And I don't need to be famous. Some people do a lot of work and they become famous. But they don't have the system to support a sustainable life. I don't want that because I learned that in my country. That's the reason that I came from my I would don't want what I had in my country. So another way for me to build home is understanding that I don't need to repeat the same mistakes. So take a moment to think, read the books that you need to read, talk to people, make your relationships to the funders, to the organizations, understand how much money I need to make a performance before I make a performance. People are making performances and they don't even understand how much mon money, I'm sorry, um, they need to, um, you know, to, to just create a healthy system in, in their creative practices. And so, you know, taking the time, which is, by the way, creep time, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. disability culture, yes. because creep time is take your time and, you know, do the things at your own pace. So making sure that, yeah, maybe I do one commission every four or five years, but I do it well. And people are happy working around me, and people feel supported, and I can pay my rent. And, you know, it was just shocking to me when the pandemic started because everybody left in New York City. Everybody left because nobody could afford to live in New York City anymore because they lost everything. Because the performers, especially the performing arts, we're just so accustomed to living paycheck by paycheck. And then if one paycheck didn't arrive, gig by gig. Yeah, yeah, gig, gig by gig. gig, exactly. And yeah. so if there wasn't one gig, one single gig in the month, they couldn't afford to live in New York. So everything fell down. That's when I realized, you know what? I have a good system with me because I was able to stay in the city for the complete time of the shutdown and yeah, I had to do some work that I didn't like, whatever, you know, but I was able to stay, and many people left, and that's because they didn't have a support system to um, to provide this kind of a stability that you need in New York City, um, which I know is a privilege, but also take your time to make the right decisions before you make the wrong decisions, right? So what I'm picking up, what I'm, what I'm hearing is, Relearning structures of how to make art. Yes. Really, relearning or really questioning values around yeah. what do I make art? What do I make? What do I, how do I make art? I'm sorry about that. Um, um, what methods am I using? What mm -hmm. networks or what communities am I engaging with? Mm -hmm. In that kind of like um, new, in that exploring a new system that is you mentioned mm. the word sustainable. Mm. So it seems to me it's really kind of like a sh change of paradigm of like how to make art mm -hmm. that has taken a long process and that helps you. I mean, it helps you literally in the financial way of like making a home of like mm -hmm. the nitty gritty stuff, paying your rent. But at the same time, it's also understanding the new politics of like how art making happens. The relationships, the, the the requests, and that, we don't necessarily, I mean, in my experience, I have really good friends that, I, that we talk about the economics of art, that doesn't mean it's like, it's not only talking about money, it's talking about the economical relationship, like the exchanges that happen through art. But I, I mean, throughout my master and throughout my education, I didn't, didn't necessarily went to a class that it was like art economy for dancers, for example. So that doesn't happen. That's not taught. The same way that that I never went to a class that is like dance admin for dancers yeah. or for like the other creators. The the the, the art making usually happens in the real life, in yeah. the in the process. Yeah. Of like our, of like everyday life, and I think I wanna um, pick up on something you said. Um, crip time, disability, and and how that also offers and brings. It's not even that offer. I wanna be very careful of the words that I use because it's like there are different needs that may not align with a traditional capitalist 
mm -hmm. um, conception of economy yeah. that is like an overproduction. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you will speak a little bit more of what your experience has been in terms of like how do your, your own needs have reframed mm -hmm. um, the paradigm that is changing in you, in you. It's like you have your who you are and what you need doesn't necessarily fit mm -hmm. into the structure that is given mm -hmm. from outside. Mm -hmm. Western thought, capitalism, mm -hmm. you know, like this expectations of like how much work you have to make in a year and all that, how many grants you have to write in a year. Mm -hmm. So if you could speak a little bit more of how your embodied experience and your need as a disabled artist mm -hmm. have also changed mm -hmm. or, or informed that new paradigm that you're mm -hmm. like trying to develop? Well, um, first of all, immigrants are always trying to understand the system, right? We're always trying to understand the system because we're new here. We want to adjust, and there is also a pressure to adjust as soon as possible. So what takes people in the US from the moment they are born to the moment they get to college, I don't know, maybe 30 years to learn the US history, we have to learn it like in three months. You know, like we have these very short periods of time to learn and, and adjust and, and understand your position in the system as an immigrant. What is your position in the system as an immigrant, and what do you want from the U.S.? The U.S. people keep telling me is not. People keep telling me the U.S. is a country of opportunities, and I keep telling people it's not a country of opportunities. It's a country of options, which is not the same. Okay, and you have the options, but you need to develop the tools to get the options. Okay, and when I say, for example, that in New York City, the first the first thing that I encountered was this ocean of ignorance. People are just doing whatever work they want to do for $15 an hour. It's just like, to me, is living in denial. And when you come to this country with no money, no resources, you need to understand how to build those resources in a way that is sustainable. Because you're not in your land. When you live in your land, there is a sense of security. You know, like, if I get fired, what? You know, there is a sense of empowerment in your own land that when you move to another country as an immigrant, you never feel that um, sense of security again in your life. As an immigrant, you're always thinking, everything is gonna fall apart, any moment, and I need to be ready for that. I need to have an emergency plan. And so, understanding disability history in the US was very important to me because disability history in my country is very different. And understanding the work of different disabled artists in the disability in the arts community as well was very um, was very powerful because I realized mm, there is a way to use capitalism that is not necessarily the same way that other fields, even in the arts, um, you know, um, let me say it this way. Dance in capitalism is one of the worst combinations because the more capitalist you become, the more poor you are, in a way. You know, the more shows you go, the more, I mean, it's just like exploitation is at every level in the capitalist um, dance community. And which is not the same in any other fields or any other communities. You know, if you're a capitalist and you're a doctor, you make a business and you make money. But it's very difficult to make money out of dance with the capitalist system, just because the body is. Unless different. you have a piece that you continue to carry on for twenty-five years and reset, like and make a, make the piece a product. Correct. That you continue to remake and remake and remake. Remake and remake the and remake and remake. Of, like art making, modern art making, this, this repertoire pieces that we carry on for years and years and years. But like you said before, this is our experience, and I guess we're talking specifically about the experimental dance mm -hmm. community, yes. right? Yes. We're not talking about the commercial dance mm -hmm. Um And so I realized that, you know, some of the principles of disability justice, some of the principles of um, immigrant communities, you know, which we practice every day, interdependence, for example, um, we make sure that we are all connected and supporting each other. Um, 
cross-disability solidarity, which happens in, in immigrant communities. It's just cross-immigration, I don't know, cross-cultural solidarity, for example. Those things have started to make sense to me when I was doing the work that I wanted to do. And the capitalist system has started to respond in a very positive way. You know, it's like, oh, we need this. We need this. People call it healing. I'm very careful about the word healing because I'm not here to heal, but I'm here to regenerate. Um, because we're all so exhausted. I mean, there is no way to heal exhaustion. You regenerate. That's the only way to keep moving. And so when people say healing, healing, I'm like, no, this is not healing. This is like more, how can we find new ways to regenerate um, and keep going as dance artists, experimental dance artists, disabled dance artists, immigrant dance artists. Um, and so I, I, you know, I discover different tools, different communities that were helping me shape my practice to a point that one day I was able to explain what I was doing. And that's the problem with many US artists, whether they are immigrants or born here, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to explain what they do. They don't know who they are. I have taken many years to understand who I am and what are my contributions in this community, what I can offer, um, understand when my offer is not well received, when I have to move on, um, when I have to let go. You know, th those things really come from a very painful process, but it's also a very beautiful process. And of course, the U.S. as a context, as a political, social context, the U.S. is always asking people, what are you doing here? You know, it's almost like you hear this question every day. What are you doing here? So if you don't, if you don't have an explanation to this mysterious being, the U.S. is talking to you, asking you, what are you doing here? If you don't have an answer, it's going to come after you. Yes. So you need to be ready and say, I'm here for this and this and this and these reasons. But many artists don't have this type of clarity because they're always working from one gig to another. They never think. They don't want to read, maybe. I don't know. We can find a million excuses. You know, There is never enough time in New York City uh, for artists to do anything. But um, that made the difference. Okay. That made the difference. Yeah, so, so I think what I want to pick up is um, you have to learn disability history in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's something that kind of like happened, was a process of learning. Not only learning by reading, but also learning by experience, and yeah. by being in community and being in relationship with people and getting to know artists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think what you touch on right now is how your migration experience mm -hmm. kind of like informed who you become as an artist. So there's this clarity of like being questioned, who are you, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. What do you want to say, and how does that like force you to really like, be very certain mm -hmm. and precise on like what what your answers were going to be? Kind of like led to also have more clarity in your art making. Would you say that that is kind of like a correlation? The more you know, like the, your migratory experience and this specific aspect of like being questioned, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Also gave you clarity in terms of your art making. And it's, it's also the context. Okay. I mean, my country is not ready for the work that I do. Okay. So being in the U.S. is being, in the, being at the right time in the right place. The right person at the right time in the right place. It takes a lot from the universe, you know, to be the right person in the right time at the right place. Because there is no context for me in any other place. I, you know, whether it's in the U.S. or Latin America. I mean, if I... You know, if I if I go to other states, people might have some empathy for the work that I do, but they might not have the same political or social context that we have in, in New York City right now, or here in New Jersey, for example, where um, there is a whole movement of disabled artists yes. and immigrant artists that are, you know that is just like a, a continuous cycle of renewal and energy and new ideas and fresh ideas and differences and, and fights and arguments. A lot of questioning. A lot of questioning, exactly. That, you know, if I go back to my country and, you know, that's not dance. Martha Graham is dance. You are not dance. You know, so it's, when people ask me, don't you want to go back to your country? No. <laughs> there is nothing left for me in my country. What is supposed to be my country, you know? I love my country, but I'm very conscious that 
in order for me to work in the work that I do, I need to be here. Mm -hmm. And so I need to fight for that space because the U.S. is also, um, again, it's not about generosity, it's about options. So the U.S. is not coming to you, hey, here is a, no. You have to fight for that space. You have to find those options. We have talk, we've talked about this and the options, um, and, and thanks for bringing that back into your, not, 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 not all options mm. are opportunities. Correct. <laughs> or not all possibilities are opportunities. That's something that is kind of like, that I learned, that, um, that it was clear to me. Um, and going back to my experience of like um, migration, um, which is totally different from one, the, the one you've had, because um, I am born into a more in a, in a territory of the United States where we belong to, we're not part, like we are mm. part of, but we don't belong. Mm. And there has been this ongoing, endless um, questioning of like who we are that has happened throughout the history of like Puerto Rican identity. Um, and people have written about it, continue to write about it. Um, for me, understanding as a, as a, as a, well, first of all, that the first thing that really pushed me out of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. is the fact that I couldn't study <laughs> dance in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, like, not even at, at a bachelor level, not at a master's level, I already had a bachelor in, 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 in Mm. Um, so my, as an adult, the decision of like starting experimenting with like ongoingness and being on the move and, and being able to move to different places, to be able to carry on my art mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be in places where, where I didn't have to explain everything that I did because people couldn't understand what artistic research was mm -hmm. seven years ago, eight years ago, um, was part of like what really motivated me to kind of like start first to move around as an independent mm -hmm. artist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. working in working my home. I mean, I, I come from Old San Juan. Old San Juan is a port, um, and we our uh, economy of Old San Juan is tourism. Mm. So then, the highest the peak of tourism is between um, November. What is cold here? In the United States. <laughs> November through April. Mm. So that is where the mayor of the, uh, a lot of people, we receive a lot of people specifically in Old San Juan. Mm. So that I determined, I was like, I am going to just be here, make money, <laughs> save as much money as I can, and then during the low season, I'm just going to go elsewhere and make my art. Mm -hmm. And I carried on that for three, four years, mm. purposely. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just going to go back to Puerto Rico, I'm going to, Fit off of like tourism, working in restaurants, just like working, 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 and then I'm gonna carry on my art somewhere else. Mm. I think that equation mm -hmm. between 2014 and 2017 was the one that really helped me to be able to um, break off from mm -hmm. the narrative of the artist that is suffering, mm -hmm. that doesn't have resources, mm -hmm. that that doesn't have spaces because mm -hmm. my, I mean. In my work in Puerto Rico, I don't have studio space access. I didn't have right. studio space access. Access. Right. So I started working with Site Specific, yeah. and just like doing performance work outdoors. And then a necessity became an aesthetic. Mm. And then I started doing more, more intentional work that is outside that is not proscenium. Mm -hmm. And it's because I just made myself conscious of it. So I mm. think I'm, I'm saying all of this to kind of like journey into this process of like. There were no options for me, or there were other options that I felt like they were not necessarily um, what I was aiming for. Uh -huh. And then actually moving, or starting to move in place, and then landing mm -hmm. um, in New York City, um, getting stranded in New York City in 2017 during Hurricane Maria, which is what happened to me. Mm. Um, I started seeing possibilities, and then I started seeing like, oh, I can. I can work as a dance ad admin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I can work at this. I've, been, I've done so much advocacy work in the feminist movement in Puerto Rico and working right, with like high right. risk populations and all that. I can bring it here mm -hmm. into the dance field. Mm. And and I first of all, I decided to be a dance admin because I needed to pay my rent. <laughs> but I remember that when I was uh, when I got stranded here and. In 2017, um, I was going by, I was supposed to go to Puerto Rico, I couldn't go because of the same thing happened, a hurricane happened, mm -hmm. I would never was able to go back. And my mom, when I was able to talk to my mom, my mom was like, 
stay where you are. Mm -hmm. Don't, because it's going to be a very difficult process. Mm. So the first opportunity that came to me, the first possibility, mm. was actually um, performing with Pramila Basudevan. Mm. And I remember going to a workshop mm. and then being offered a residency and work. Mm. And that was like outstanding for me. It's like I'm stranded in New York City. I'm going to this dance workshop to try to soothe myself because it's my birthday mm -hmm. <laughs> and my country is going through, through a process very difficult. So that what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. And I get this opportunity. So that was the moment for me that I was like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Do I take it? Do I stay? And then what are the conditions of staying here? Mm -hmm. Which I think is what you're talking about. Um, and I really kind of like will want to move a little bit more towards that direction. Because you're building your conditions through learning. Mm -hmm. What I hear is like through your learning process, through mm -hmm. your re-education process of the concepts, mm -hmm. you're building your conditions for you to make home and to be able to stay. And it happens that because of your embodiment mm -hmm. that is art related, mm -hmm. that is politically, that is highly political, mm -hmm. highly spiritual, mm -hmm. and is also disabled. Mm -hmm. So I think there are many intersections there that that you embody that. I have other intersections that I embody. Um, and I just want to kind of like do that navigation <laughs> synthesis because I feel um, I feel that it resonates with me a little bit, this aspect of like there are possibilities or there are options, mm -hmm. but they may not necessarily be opportunities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, first of all, happy birthday. <laughs> 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 Um, to put it very simple, people don't understand how difficult it is to be an artist in Latin America and the things people have to do to make art in Latin America. Um, that said, I don't justify the Latin American artists replicating these systems that are not taking the arts community anywhere. They live in this denial, again, I don't do my work for money. My work has nothing to do with capitalism, so they're basically a starving. And when I say a starving, is real. When I came to New York City, I was eating only one meal a day in Costa Rica because I couldn't afford to have three meals in Costa Rica. And you were working, try, trying to work as an artist, or were you? I was a teaching artist. Okay. I was a teaching um, artist, you know, dance classes day and night. I had a little studio where that, that was my dance studio and my apartment at the same time. Um, but it was just, it's, it's just the economy is not built in a way that is sustainable for artists because it's all dependent to the state. Mm. And so the state, if the state makes significant cuts to the culture and arts, which happens in every country, mm -hmm. then we are all in abandonment. Mm. Like there is no other option. Mm. Um, and so when I moved to New York City, I was very conscious that I needed to improve my financial stability, but I didn't want to dance. Mm. I was deeply hurt. I didn't want to dance anymore because I was rejected so much. I was 34. I also came to New York City very late. I didn't come when I was 21, so I didn't make the mistakes that the 21-year-old made. Uh. You know, that was positive as well. Um, and I came to New York City to be a chef. Mm. I didn't want to be a dancer. I wanted to be a chef. And because my dad just died and he was living in New York City, um, I thought that I had a way to apply for my citizenship. Yeah. So I stayed. And I paid my lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And then the political asylum, the request, everything was denied. Because I came at the same time that the, the process was moving forward, but then Trump got elected. Yeah. It was a whole mess with the immigration system. So I decided to stay undocumented. Yeah. And I worked in kitchens because I had my way around already, you know. And um, I talked about this um, on Monday at the Lewis Center for the Arts, but um, I found my way back to dance because of this workshop that I took with Trisha Brown Dance Company, and you know, and some beautiful words that I received in that in that space. But it was interesting because even though I I was working in kitchens as a chef, as a cook, blah blah blah, dance was always knocking on my door. It was impossible to run away from dance. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna go back. You know, it's that abusive relationship, like you beat me, I leave you, you know, and so, okay, I'm coming back, but don't touch me, you know, like keep your distance. You sleep in your room, I sleep in my room. 
And we came back together after a long pause. We came back together and I said, okay, this is the way things are gonna be now. You're not making the same mistakes, you're gonna make a living as a dancer, as a choreographer, but um, understanding the system and navigating the system, especially in the arts in the US, is an art form. And people don't take the time to understand the New York Foundation for the Arts or the uh, Foundation for the Contemporary. And people don't understand with, with, where these foundations how so you think that there's the opportunity again? Do we're like okay, let's let's just learn you. Let's just relearn to learn. Relearn, 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 and in the way you find people that are in the same search, you know, for life mm -hmm. and for answers, and and you make your own community, and you know that these people are not really your community. They have a different path, a different direction, and so you start building community with people that have the same, you know, uh, goals. I also have to say that I have. I know the difference between thinking and feeling. And artists usually don't, know, don't understand the difference between thinking and feeling. And that is a major, there is a major difference there and that made a difference for me. You know, because people take things personally sometimes or they feel that the whole industry is against them or they feel that the uh, selection process wasn't fair. I know the difference between thinking and feeling. And so I, in a way, it's, it's, uh... <sighs> Are you talking about rational, are you talking about cognitive, rational thinking, like the process of the process rationalizing of thinking. or analyzing something? The cellular, you know, like the body is a thinker. I think through my body. The body is a thinker. And I, I <laughs> let, you know, when it's time for emotions, let's be emotional, okay. you know? And that's what the studio is for most of the time, you know? but. In every single step of the process, which is not always creative, when you're making art, not every single step in the process is creative and emotional. You also need to take a moment to be rational and think Amazing. Okay, so then you're, and make decisions. So what you're talking about is like to differentiating when to engage into a more, this is what I'm getting from what you're, what you're expressing. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, that there was this process of like understanding when do I do I unleash my emotional thinking? When yeah. do I unleash my more rational analytical thinking in Correct. relationship to art making? When is it gonna be more like sensorial, like to be able to navigate different aspects? Absolutely, of the absolutely. And we're we're artists and we love to be in these spaces that are completely abstract sometimes. But I mean, when I was applying for the fellowship here or the Princeton University Arts Fellowship. I could never say that that was an emotional process. Mm. You know, it was a thoughtful, philosophical learning experience just to complete the application here for the Princeton University Arts Fellowship. And I needed to explain in 300 words who I was. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not simple. And it takes years and years of personal and social research to understand that. And that's when I when I say that's the difference sometimes that artists get caught up in this sentimental emotion, yes. emotional yes. state, you know, and and they're not capable of translating those emotions into you know a more rational mm -hmm. thinking way. And I was thinking, I think what you're saying right now is also resonating to me in terms of like what aspect. First, what narrative voice are you using to mm -hmm. talk about your experience? Mm -hmm. So I think I, I want to think in this like either rational thinking or emotional thinking as the narrative voice with which you decide to portray your story. Mm -hmm. But then also what part of your story you have to put out in order for people to get what okay. you're doing or to get who you are or to okay. understand in like minimal words where you're coming from or where you're headed into. Um, I want to like be there and be conscious about time. Um, there's you you talked about your experience. Um, you wanted to come to the United States to be a chef. Yeah. And we've talked about this. Um, I don't first. cook anymore. No, I'm just, <laughs> no, 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 of course. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that experience of like being like in that moment that you decided to re to give a new opportunity to dance mm -hmm. 
Um, how, how did you balance the being in kitchens and working in kitchens? How did that support your dance artistry? Mm -hmm. We will talk a little bit. And I, I'm purposely talking about this because a lot of our fellow dancers are waiters and waitresses yeah. and servers, and yeah. that's how they pay their rent. And the comment you made about people yeah. leaving you know, you're getting COVID is because people were doing well, yeah. receiving patients that came actually from their service. Yeah. And service shut down. And that's a reality. That was a reality in New York City. Artists were servers and none of those things were happening. So they had to flee wherever home was and wherever they could be. Mm -hmm. If you could talk a little bit about that, it would be very insightful. Like to know how the, how your kitchen work, your restaurant work, your what did you learn there, and how did that support your artistry? Um, I mean, kitchens, Jesus, I mean, it's a whole culture. People people yes. have no idea what happens, uh, what, what they call the back of the house. Mm -hmm. The back of the house. The pretty people are the front of the house, right? And then the not pretty people, which is the indigenous black immigrants, you know, people that are not, you know, um, pretty in the eyes of this Western idea of beauty. We all go to the back. And their networks. First of all, I wasn't documented. Mm -hmm. How do you get paid? How do you pay taxes? How do you rent a room? Like, how do you, how do you exist in this society when you don't have documents? Mm -hmm. There is an answer for all of these things in every single kitchen. There is always Maria, you know, it's great to give you the number of Jose who works at the Chase in Brooklyn, Flatbush, and they will open a bank account for you with no documents, you know? And so housing, banking, taxing, you know, all of these things that are so important. By the way, you know, just to clarify, undocumented people pay taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big stereotype that undocumented people don't pay taxes. We pay taxes because believe me, the moment that we get the documents, IRS is coming after you. So you don't want to have that problem. Actually, you don't get the documents if you owe money to the IRS. It's as simple as that. So to me, kitchens were also very important, that, uh, you know, especially the first years in New York City because I came from a tropical country and you know, winter, it was my first winter, like anywhere. And so being in the kitchen in those warm temperatures was very, it, it was a relief, you know, for me to be always um, in the kitchen, knowing that I will always have a meal mm -hmm. three times a day and alcohol as well, you know, <laughs> which was helpful at the time as well, you know, and having those networks, those connections, you meet people from so many levels. I mean, you see people in New York City driving taxis, taxis um, cooking, serving, cleaning the sidewalk, and those are doctors mm -hmm. and lawyers. They're just finding their way, you know, off. they're finding the right option for them. You know, the moment they have another job that they don't hate as much, they will leave, you know, because that's, that's New York City too, you know? And so you meet so many intelligent people. But you also meet people that cross the border um, through the desert, mm -hmm. and you hear their stories, and their friends who didn't make it. Um, and what's really important to me in the kitchens, what I really learned is that I don't know any immigrant that don't work hard. Mm -hmm. This is stereotype that immigrants come here to take. No. I mean, I'm pretty sure that there are people that don't like to work. I understand that. But I have never met any immigrant, whether I like the person or not, that don't work hard to stay in the U.S. So understanding that culture of hard work, which is different from hyper-productivity mm -hmm. in capitalism. I like to make the difference because a lot of people say, you know, um, but that's capitalism, it's hyper -productive. No, it's hard work. Just like as, as a disabled artist, there is rigor in my work. Because I'm disabled, it doesn't mean that I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. My work is as rigorous as any other choreographer. It just happens that I need to take more time or that I need to find the, the different ways to do it that are accessible for me and my collaborators. But there is rigor. And I learned that rigor, that sense of responsibility, um, that sense of love also for giving people something they like. I mean, I, 
you know, cooks are probably responsible for giving happiness to people because, I mean, the food that we give, you know, and when they taste it, and it's all of that I learn in the kitchen. And of course, I can I can be more poetic and say, oh, I'm not you know. I learn about portions <laughs> and portion, how, how much of a choreography portion I need for this show, you know. It's all about the temperature, when it's ready, when it's cold. You know, I, I it, and I can say and go on, and this is true. I learn so many things by cooking that I can apply to choreographing. Sometimes it's not about the temperature, sometimes it's about the portion. Maybe you need less dancers. Sometimes it's about the timing, you know, sometimes you need 30 minutes, sometimes it's the whole night cooking, you know, a slow cooking. So you learn those things in metaphors, you know, people think, oh, don't be so sentimental. But, <laughs> but you also learn things about network and about community and about... And I still talk to them. Yes, you know, if, yes. if you ask me, would you like to go and talk to this, I don't know, famous writer or whatever, which, you know, I have the connections now with many people that are so, you know, um, known in the community, you know, I still go and have my coffee with my undocumented family, which, you know, I deeply appreciate and because I am in a different position. I came here in an airplane, so I was able to apply for my visa. They didn't because they came by land and they crossed the border. And so um, for some people, there is no solution to their citizenship status. Um, that's my undocumented family. I meet them regularly and I don't talk about art. <laughs> you know, I talk about everything but art. Mm, ah, interesting. Good to, good to know that. Um, um, should we open yeah, it sure. for questions? Yes, thank you. I just want to pause for a second. Can we applaud because this has been such yeah. an incredible conversation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions they'd like to ask? I was just checking to see the um, online. I didn't see anything. No? Um, it's hard because I was processing so much and so moved. <laughs> Um, really, by what you were saying, it was such a um, thoughtful discussion. Um, how long? How long have you? You've been here since twenty eighteen. Maria, Maria, Maria. Um, uh, thanks for asking. So, um, my mom migrated to Massachusetts when she was eighteen, and then she went back to Puerto Rico. So, I really it took it took me. I finally landed in New York City, or was stranded in New York City in twenty seventeen. And that was what moved me to um, actually New York City, Brooklyn, which is where I live now. But I do have an ongoing relationship to being in the United States because half of my family from Puerto Rico migrated to Massachusetts. Um, I always identify myself as an islander, born and raised on the island. And it has been in living in, in Brooklyn and going through a process of like really reacting myself who I am and what is happening. That I really realized that my that I have been that my identity is an ongoing mm -hmm. identity. I have been migrating throughout my life, visiting family here, being in Puerto Rico. Um, so I'm rediscovering really that process of like being an ongoing migrant artist in that or, or person in that sense. But I finally got to Brooklyn in 2017 during Hurricane Maria. Wow. I was here um, passing by, working actually, making some money here before going back, and and I. I was not able to go back. Thank you. Christopher, can I ask you, I don't know if this is a fair question, um, what you feel or how your life is changing or what you're seeing as a, you know, as, as a Lewis Center for the Arts fellow? Like if that's like what, what that has brought to your life or what, what your feelings about it. And if you say, oh. that's not a good question, that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's life changing. There is no question about it. I mean, foundations and organizations that never wanted to talk to me now want to talk to me because I have the fellowship in my resume, um, the resources. I go back to New York City and I tell them they have money and they use it so wisely. And they, you know, uh, Princeton has such a generous way to distribute the resources that they have. Really, that's what the people tell me, really. And I'm like, yeah, we should be learning more from um, these structures because, I mean, working in New York City is most of the time working with a scarcity. Mm -hmm. And so when I came here, which is not so long ago, just a few months ago, um, and just recently started <laughs> teaching, I realized that there are ways to do things differently. 
that not everything has to be suffering, that not everything has to be scarcity, that not everything has to be like begging someone to do something, you know? And I'm, I'm the button. Yeah, but the thing is, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do when the, when the fellowship is over because I'm getting so used to it now that, you know, I don't know, whoever whoever comes after Princeton is, is you know, has a lot of problems. It's gonna have a lot of problems with me, dealing with me and my requirements of work, but no, really, um, is life changing? I have I have no words to express uh, what what it means to be here as an institution. What I'm learning from the students, from the staff, from the faculty, from these events. I mean, it's been three weeks, but it's been the most intense weeks of my life. I mean, it's one thing after another, and I'm just so happy because people want to talk and they're so interesting and interested. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wonder, Mr. Nunez, if you would talk a little bit about the teaching that you're doing yeah. uh, and how you're sharing. What's your name? My name is Paula. 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 Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paula. I'm teaching a course uh, that is called Introduction to Radical Access, Disability Justice in the Arts. And I didn't have any expectations. I was expecting five people to sign up for the class, maybe. We have 20 students wow. and, and a waiting list. And yeah, young people want to be accessible. Young people want to talk about disability, but also I have disabled students in the class that are coming out. They never talked about the, their disability before. And so I think representation matters, because the moment that I entered the space and I said, I am disabled and I'm proud of being disabled, and there is a way to be disabled and, and, and to be an artist, and these are the ways that we can make work based on our own experiences, right? Um, they needed that push. And at the same time, when we are in class and you know we're watching videos or reading or whatever, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging people to have rigorous conversations. This is not about you liking everything. It's not about liking everything. You can be critical. You can say no, I don't like this. I mean, this is a this, this is a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so, is the first time that we do something like this. I'm maybe wrong, but I think it's the first class of this nature at the Louis Center for the Arts. Maybe not, but I'm I'm, I'm sensing that. It is a work in progress. My syllabus is changing every day. Yeah. And every day I go into the space and I don't know what I'm facing. You know, I have disabled students that are not feeling well, chronically ill people that are not feeling well. So I'm like, okay, everybody lay down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really, I, this is what happened on Monday. We're going to take a one hour nap. Mm -hmm. The students, we did the check in and the students were so exhausted. Mm -hmm. And they told me, we are so exhausted. And I said, okay, everybody lay down, let's go and get some yoga mat, you know, lay down, play some music, very beautiful music, and everybody took a nap for one hour. And that was part of the class. I mean, it's just, let's understand that this is culture, that this is something that we can do in our classes, that this can be a creative practice as well. Taking care of ourselves is a form of art as well. So that's how things are going. I don't know what next week is going to be about, you know. <laughs> I have an agenda, but they flip it over, they turn it upside down, and they want to do different things, and I want to empower the students to yeah. also take over the space and see what they do. There's so much pedagogy in rest, mm. so much yes. wisdom in like enabling rest as part of who we are, but really make not, not being in the production, that we integrate that into the pedagogy yeah. the space for like breath, the space for rest, is really, that's where the radicalness comes in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I yeah, no. wired to work, 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 it's like to do, 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 and to read, 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 but you know, the brain and the body needs space to process, either it needs instruction mm. or knowledge. It was, it was an active rest. Yeah, we, yeah, were listening yeah. to a podcast. <laughs> we were listening to a podcast and we, you, yeah. we were doing things, but I told them, relax, mm -hmm. you know, like take a moment, this is like an active nap. Just thinking about uh, Trisha Hershey's nap ministry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I actually saw her speak the nap ministry. She's wonderful. Uh, hi, I'm Janie. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Christopher, will there be a chance for us to see you perform sure. as part of your residency? Um, I was watching um, on YouTube your um, garden shape. What's, what's the name of the dance piece? Oh, a garden in the shape of dreams. A garden in the shape of dreams, which I just. Well, I'd love to see that perform here at the Lewis Center, but are you going to be working on a piece with your students, or will there be a chance to see Great your work? Question. 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, I think so. I mean, we're open to so many things. I love to perform. Um, I'm here to uplift the work of the students because it's a teaching fellowship. Um, I'm inviting my friends to come and perform, and my friends happen to be like some of the most brilliant artists right now in the in the U.S., right? And so we have Kayla Hamilton and X performing on October 25th. Um, we're going to make an event and invite everyone to come. It's open to the public. I love to perform, and that's probably part of the fellowship, you know, um, program at some point. The students, yes. We know that we are presenting something open to the public at the end of the course because the idea is that they learn how to make art accessible and the economics of that, how expensive, how much it costs to make something. And Kim knows a little bit more about this, organizing this beautiful event with ASL Inter. It's work. It's a lot of labor. It needs support. And people need to understand that access is needed, is necessary, but if you make the commitment, it's a lot of work. And it's loving labor, it's because it's for our communities, but people have this misunderstanding that it's easy to make something accessible, it's not. And so we're going to this process of teaching and teaching the students about audio description and ASL interpretation and closed captioning and, and different forms of access. And so at the end, I'm either choreographing something for them and they're doing something with access or or I am dancing and they're doing something accessible for me. I don't know what that's going to look like. It's still in the making. So we'll see. Last chance for questions. Okay. Thank you both so, so much. It's been a really wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.